Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Uh, really national politics talk. The 2014 midterm elections. A bigger Republican House, a GOP Senate, the 2016 presidential election, a Dem other than Hillary. Which of a crowd of Republicans? What issue? What's the story? Here to talk all this talk is one of the wisest of political wise men, Ed Rollins. Ed has served four U.S. presidents, including two tours as assistant to the president. In 1984, he managed President Reagan's landslide re-election campaign and also has directed congressional relations at two cabinet agencies. Ed's vita is huge. Currently, he's a senior presidential fellow at Hofstra University. Ed. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, nice to be with you. My pleasure, and it is always nice to go to see you for my postdoctoral seminar. Oh, thank you. Okay, let's start with a report put out by Pew Research in June, and it's titled Political Polarization in the American Public. And let me just read the conclusion. One of the conclusions, Republicans and Democrats are more divided along ideological lines and pa partisan antipathy is deeper and more extensive than any point in the last two decades. Is this too time limited? You go back a long time. I would say it's more than the last two decades. Well, I definitely think I've, I've been in the game 50 years. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, I was looking at the, the Almanac of American Politics, one of the great Bibles of mine, Michael Barone has put out every year. Sure. Um, after this election, there will not be a single senator who's left who was there when I went to Washington in 1972. Wow. There are two House members who will be there who were there before I arrived in 1972. And that was the, 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 the Watergate year and all, all the debacle that came during that period of time. The entire Congress has changed. And I think what's happened in the changing of the Congress is that you have this polarization. And people think it's all about Congress. And really, it's the country. As you see this poll, uh, there are people, and I think, People have to understand that, in, in a very simple way, I think Democrats see big government as an opportunity to shift resources and to do things, not necessarily bad things, but to do things for constituency groups that they believe in. Uh, Democrats, Republicans think we spend too much money and, and that we basically uh, shouldn't raise taxes uh, and we need to reform the entitlement programs that they see long term as, as detrimental to us. So when you have those two ideologies, uh, one not wanting to spend any more money and the other one wanting to spend more money, you begin in a pretty serious place. Yeah, and also it, it, it almost goes beyond this sort of uh, issues and, and, and there's almost a deep partisan animosity and a greater ideological and partisan cohesion. And in a sense, the view of the other party is that they're more than misguided, they're almost treasonous. I mean, is, is, is it me or is, is the well, atmosphere we, we, poisonous? It is poisonous. And we forget the overarching theme of all of it is that we're Americans. We're, 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 we've been blessed by two parties since uh, 1856. Uh, the two parties, obviously, uh, minor parties have tried to get into the game many times, but haven't ever been successful. But with these two major parties, you basically, who've changed dramatically. I mean, it, it, it was a period of time when uh, uh, the, the Republican Party was founded because it was the, the anti-slavery party. Uh, today, the Democratic Party basically is the party of, 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 of people of color. Uh, I think there's a polarization. Uh, there's a, we, we have a tendency to have older voters. They have a tendency to have younger voters. We have a tendency to have white voters, southern voters. They have a tendency to have uh, what I call the urban voters, the, the coast voters. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, it's, it's a real, when you really look at the demographics as political scientists, it's a, it's a fascinating study. It's not a fascinating process to watch in action. And I think to a certain extent, uh, it, it'll continue. I mean, the, the reality here is Republicans, I think, are going to take the Senate uh, by a narrow margin. And I think, it, but they could lose it again in two years. Uh, equally as important, the House is now entrenched. The House, as the Democrat House was back when I was in the White House uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, 
Uh, I think you're not going to have reapportionment uh, census again until uh, till 2020. Uh, the next election, which the new seats will be drawn, yep. is 2022. Uh, that's eight years from now. And so the reality is that the next president will have a Republican Congress, uh, whether he or she likes that, uh, and equally as important. Whether they're Republican or, or Democrat. Democrat. And, and so unless there's a relationship, unless you develop who you sit down and willing to give, uh, you're just going to be in this, uh, this stalemate. Big major issues like transportation bills. Uh, I, I was my, when my first job, I was Assistant Secretary of Congressional Affairs, Department of Transportation. Highway bills were, were the simplest thing in the world. It's yep. always a five-year farm bill. These, yeah, right. these, these were bills yep. that were not big battles. Now you can't get any of those things through. And, and I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, the Congress is not functioning. It's not passing its budget. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. And as we're on the verge of going into what people are saying could be a 30-year war in the Middle East, uh, the idea that the Congress is not demanding to debate this uh, is just absurd. Yeah, the, the abdication of the war power is really quite astounding. Absolutely. Okay. Is there a Republican wave? Every everybody you look at it, whether it's you know the Cook Report, Rothenberg, Sabbath, all the wise guys, say what you say that the Republicans are likely to take the Senate and can, can control the House. Let's let's go through the map a little bit. Where where do the Republicans pick up the six seats that they need? It's fifty five forty five now. In order to flip it, you got to switch. A very, Talk about the dynamic. First of all, it's a very important dynamic to always understand in the midterm, which you understand, and maybe your viewers don't. There's forty million fewer voters participate in midterms. There's a right. dramatic drop off uh, because there's not there's not the interest in the presidential. There's advertising. There's an excitement. Uh, and so the, the idea that you're going to go march out and go vote for your congressman is not quite as exciting. Sure. It never has been. So there's a drop off. There's a parity in voting today. Uh, people self-identify as Democrats and Republicans. It's darn near even. Uh, maybe a one or two percent advantage uh, to uh, to Democrats, which is nothing uh, because of the voter intensity. Of sure. There are a plurality of voters declare themselves independent today, but there's no place for an independent to go. Uh, so, so what happens is the voting pattern. Nine out of ten of these people who say they're independent have a voting pattern. They vote Democrat traditionally, or they vote Democrat or Republican traditionally. So you're down to a point where you've got a polarization uh, in the electorate. You have a lot of unhappiness in the electorate. No one's going to go out and vote joyfully. Uh, and I've said over and over again. Uh, uh, in the state of Nevada, you have none of the above on the ballot. If you had none of the above on this ballot, uh, uh, that would, I would get a plurality of votes, I would say, in a majority of places. So you're in an environment to where uh, people aren't very happy, uh, not a tendency to vote, uh, certainly not happy with the president, certainly not happy with the Congress. At the end of the day here, I think, uh, you know, our voters may be more intensified, and the president is obviously a draw against the Democrats at this point in time. We can make a bigger issue than they can make of people getting out to vote for him. But when you start on looking at the seats, uh, uh, they just happen to be this, by, by coincidence, happen to be in states that Romney carried. Uh, right. So, and then, then there's several of them are open. So let's begin with the four open seats. Um, obviously, uh, the, the, the South Dakota is a seat that... that it's going to go it's Republican. It's going to go Republican. They're now making a little issue out of it uh, because Larry Presser, the former senator who's not lived in the state, was defeated a number of years ago, lives in Washington, D.C., is, is running as an independent. You know, he's not, he's not going to be a viable factor at the end of the day. Uh, you have the Montana seat. Uh, That's gone. Which, which, which is gone. Uh, you have, a, you have uh, uh, Iowa, which has now become a very competitive race where most yeah, people... Yeah, talk about Iowa. I mean, that's the I, open I, hawk and see. Iowa, Iowa, Iowa's a very interesting st state. It's a state that basically has always been split. It's, it can elect the most conservative Republican to one Senate seat and the most liberal Democrat to the other Senate seat. And that's the way, the way it's been for the last 20, 25 years. Uh, it's, a, it's a state that's the ultimate swing state. Uh, you have four congressional seats. They're split. Uh, so I think in this particular case, we are very fortunate as Republicans to get this extraordinary candidate, uh, Joni Ernst. Joni Ernst is a farmer, state senator, a 22-year veteran of the National Guard, an Iraq War veteran, uh, attractive, articulate, uh, uh, and really fits the image. And I think if she, she beats the, the, the congressman she's running against, uh, uh, which I think she will. She's a couple points ahead at this point in time. She'll be a superstar. Uh, so I, 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 but that's I, a close one. It's that's very, relatively. It's, it's close. very, very close. Two or three points. Okay. Most of these are, are very close. Then, then you've so you've got got the open seats, and I may have missed one or two here, just in my 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 
lack of memory as I get older. Uh, Please. But the, op the open seats. I did, the but I, I have the open the seats problem. Were, then you're going to knock out a couple of incumbents. Uh, the most vulnerable incumbents are uh, Pryor in Arkansas, right. Mary Lando and Louisiana. Uh, a lot of people thought we were going to win uh, in North Carolina. That's a very competitive race. Uh, she's That's the Hagan seat. The Hagan seat, and she's, she's run a good campaign, and she may squeak it out. But I think, I think the reality here is that um, uh, it's not over yet. Uh, then we've got a couple of incumbents on our side that are, that are never thought would be vulnerable, starting with the minority leader, uh, Mitch McConnell. Is, is he really vulnerable? I don't think so. I think what, what's happened is uh, people think he's prickly, think he's been around a long time. Uh, they've now gone back and reminded Kentuckians how much he's done for the state over the last yep. few years. Yep, okay. There. And so I think at the end of the day, you have to say to this, I mean, a, a very simple ad I would run. Uh, K Kentuckians are not fools. Are you going to take someone who's going to be the most powerful man in Washington, D.C., uh, fighting for your state versus someone who who's, comes in as a rookie? I, I think that's a pretty easy, easy choice. Uh, Has he run that in? Nobody, but I think they will. Okay. That's, that's what I, that's, that would have been my campaign okay. from start to finish. Okay. But Maybe I, I'll watch the show and that, pick up on what you're so, suggesting. So whatever. Well, there's smart people running their campaign. So, uh, uh, then you've then you've got a race in Kansas. That, uh, uh, to me, this in many ways, this is the most interesting uh, race, the Roberts race. Roberts, that that Senate seat has never been re Democrat seat. Uh, it, it was Bob Dole's seat before. It's uh, Roberts is, a, is it fit Kansas very well. Uh, he was the chairman of the Ag Committee, been in the Senate uh, for three terms. Uh, uh, he had a big, severe primary, uh, and, I, and I think it's kind of a, a, an Eric Cantor type situation where he kind of lost touch a little bit with the district, doing a lot more in Washington than he should have been doing back in Kansas. Uh, uh, they've sort of routed that, sh that, that ship, and I think he's going to be okay, but at this point in time, it's, it's been, a, been a competitive race, more competitive than I think he wants, but everybody's in there. It's a unified party. And the other thing that's happened to us this time is we have a unified party, uh, the Tea Party element, uh, which is a very significant part of our, our electorate today. Uh, is now pretty much not running candidates or hasn't been successful in running their candidates in the primaries and they're kind of coming in and supporting supporting the, the nominees that we have uh, so okay so I may have missed one or two so years. yeah i mean i mean you know you've got uh colorado with the Udall race i mean there are several races but it seems that the conventional wisdom right now overwhelmingly is five to eight seats and most observers are picking the, the reps to take the Senate. Yeah, I think we will take the Senate. I think we could go as high as eight seats. Um, uh, and again, depending on what happens to our own incumbents. Uh, sure. And, and I would predict at this point in time that we're not going to lose an incumbent. Uh, and so I think it, including Roberts, including Roberts. OK, uh, um, so I think I think we pick up eight seats uh, and that gives us that gives you plus two. Right. That's really now the drill here is you then have the chairmanships, you then have the majority leader uh, switching hands. Uh, you, you then have to have an agenda. You have to move a house. You have the house. You have the the, the Senate. Uh, you've got to move an agenda, and you obviously have a president that has veto power. So, uh, what's the agenda, and what's the nature of the politics? Is it totally deadlocked? Let's say. And then we'll talk about the House momentarily. The Republicans not only retain the House but expand the House, take the Senate. The president is of the other party. Total deadlock? Well, if the president does not want to cooperate uh, uh, and does not want to basically make some concessions, then you can. Then he has the power because it's not going to be two thirds to override anything. But if and, and he wasn't willing, and, you know, the problem is the first two years he didn't need Republicans and he didn't get Republicans. Right. So when he passed health care and Dodd Frank and all those, sort of, those are two major pieces of legislation that probably are the most impact anything. Obamacare, which Republicans want to repeal, that's not going to happen. Uh, the, uh, Dodd uh, uh, Frank is is a is a bill that obviously the financial institutions would like to make some alteration. Historically, when you have big legislation that's passed. Uh, thousand page bills you come back and you revise them next year right many times right before. we've not been able to do that Obamacare if you can't repeal it you need to fix it uh, right because it, it's it's not working in a lot of different places and it did nothing to bring down the cost but the problem is uh, when one party wants to repeal it the other party doesn't want to touch it uh, and the president doesn't want to touch it uh, any any alterations to that bill could be vetoed uh, so everything's stalemated um, essentially yeah what you can do though is you could have a tax reform bill uh, you could basically, which we need, and everyone argues at certain points of view, uh, we can have some immigration bill. We can't have the Senate bill, but you can certainly have some elements of that. Um, but my sense is you're going to have an aggressive Republican agenda. Uh, you've got some very smart people, Paul Ryan, uh, Dave Camp, who's now leaving the Congress, but Dave Camp did an extensive job of doing tax reform. 
couldn't get it, couldn't get it anywhere on the floor. But he basically studied the tax issue for four years, brought in all kinds of experts. He was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, from, and and the likelihood is Paul Ryan's going to pick that ball up. Uh, he hasn't announced yet whether he's going to be chairman, but if he becomes the chairman of the Ways and Means and decides not to be run for president, uh, he's a very smart guy and may very well basically. Uh, there's there's three major pieces of legislation that need to be dealt with. Uh, one is tax reform. We clearly need to need to get our capital uh, uh, structure changed. Uh, we have to eliminate some deductions. We have to basically get our, our corporate rate lowered because otherwise we're just going to find all these companies doing inversion, leaving the country, going other places. If Canada has a lower tax rate, it's no big deal to go to Canada uh, than it is to be in And they speak the language. In, in Detroit, it's a little colder, but go ahead. But it's true. It's, it's the reality. It's, uh, so you've got to basically, you can't have the highest tax rate in the world for corporations and not have have impact. So you have taxes? Uh, I think we need to do something on immigration and I think the bottom line is immigration is complicated. People forget it took, uh, I was I was very involved in the 86 uh, measure in the Reagan White House, it took us five years to get to that point and it was a bipartisan effort. Uh, there, were, uh, there were Democrat chairmen that were involved in it uh, and it took five years to get it done and you know it, it may take us, may take us two years, may take us four years. It's not going to be an open border situation but you do have to do something about, uh, and it's not going to be purely the Chamber of Commerce. We, you keep all the bright people and you kick out all the dumb people. Uh, you know, my, if only you could do that. My, 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 sense, is, my sense is that uh, we're, we're a nation that, that's 330 million people today. We can expand the number of people who come to this country legally, and we need to do that. Okay. And budget reform, that's the other thing we do. Oh, go ahead. You know, we, we clearly need to basically... We need more revenue. Uh, you just can't continue to operate uh, uh, the idea that you're losing six, seven hundred billion dollars a year of borrowing that, and even more. We're going to go back to the trillion dollar very quickly. You just can't do that indefinitely. It's, you're putting a burden on, on the young people. They won't be getting the resources. We're not going to grow our way out of it as we have in the past. So we need more revenue. We have to figure out how we get more revenue. Uh, and anything has tax on it, basically Republicans fight it and a lot of Democrats fight it. But somehow we need to either get revenue by more growth or you get revenue by more, uh, by more uh, income through the, through the government. Uh, and, and we need to basically uh, rethink our priorities on spending. Okay. Tip O'Neill famously argued that all politics is local, but if you look at both the Senate races and the various House races, many of them, it's sort of a combination of the local and the national. Obama plays very large in these races, and Democrats are running away, and Republicans are tagging Democrats with Obama. How did Obama become such an albatross in... I guess the Democratic Party uh, prospects in this cycle. Well, I think I think it's it's a question of leadership and competency. I think to a certain extent, the president, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, is viewed today as is uh, is not very competent or not maybe thoughtful, but not but not not someone who basically uh, is providing the leadership the country needs. And the country has all kinds of crises. You pick the paper up every day, and there's something, or watch TV, or whatever young people do. They don't. Do either of those two? Uh, nice. Uh, it's, well, it's true, and 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 you know, you got Ebola, you got a crisis, you got you got another potential after 12 years of war in the Middle East. It looks like we're going to go there, and people talk about a 30-year war against ISIS. So ISIS was something we didn't even know about six months ago, uh, and so you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, and and there's a lot of um, and 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 what's occurring is people are saying, well, we made recommendations. I, I've never seen a situation where. Military leaders in and out of the government are basically saying, you know, we've given the president advice. He doesn't take our advice. Uh, they ask us to go fight these wars, uh, and yet they don't take our counsel. The more of that that comes forth, and then he, he doesn't understand the symbolism. You know, this is a guy who's very interesting, who basically at, at his, we reminded of his convention when he had this extraordinary convention with pillars, Greek pillars, and sure. all the rest of it, one of the great, great conventions, great inaugurals, what have you, now does not understand the symbolism of the White House. The symbolism of White House is you don't basically talk about Ebola for 35 seconds and then go out and play golf. Uh, you don't basically uh, give sympathy to people that their heads chopped off to the families to go out and play golf. Uh, you can play golf, but you don't have to basically, you have to understand the, the, the visuals that are out there. And I think to a certain extent, uh, this is a very cerebral president who, who a lot of people uh, uh, basically think does not, does not have the competence. Yeah, and also I think, I, I think the, the faulty rollout of Obamacare really, in, in, in some sense, if you, if you looked at the data, is sort of an inflection point here as well. It's sort of a, epitomized the feeling that you're talking about. 
Well, there's n never been a major piece of legislation in my 50 years, and, I, and, and as a student of many legislation before my, I started in this business, that you didn't have a bipartisan situation. Uh, you had Democrats and Republicans, and you had to make some compromises on both sides to get that. Yeah, but that's part of this polarization. Part you don't that, have any that, of was, that. There was not a single vote on any of this, and there was not a desire to have any of this vote. It was sort of like, what deal do I have to make to get the last Democrats? No deals to get Republicans in. And I think, to a certain extent, I don't think Republicans started out to be anti-Obama. I think what happened is they were locked. Well, that's debatable, but we but won't debate. Okay. They were locked out of the stimulus bill, and they were locked out of the out of the Obamacare. So they figured they only benefited from that. And so why basically right. why go cooperate with the president? It's not very popular. And I think in the course of this campaign, as you see, uh, Democrats running every which way uh, from this president. And I think the, the the tragedy of this is this, you know, once again, this president has two more years uh, in office. Uh, and you know you're you're a historian, a political scientist. Uh, I've I've never seen a president quite written off as quickly as he is uh, with two years left to go. What about George Bush? I mean, you've said that Obama is the worst president of the 20th century and 21st century. I disagree. I think George Bush is, but Bush had problems in, from 2006 to 2008. No, no question about it. And he had wars and he had economies and all the rest of it. Uh, I mean, I, I think I think this president inherited. Probably as big a mess as any mo not not the only president inherited messes. I mean, lots of presidents inherited messes, and, and you go back and watch the brilliant uh, Roosevelt series that PBS just yes. did. Uh, uh, you know, there, there were there were pretty trying times for both of those men, and both those men were significant leaders. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and I think to a certain extent, when you watch something like that, this president pales by by comparison. And I think to a certain extent, at probably the most troubled time in modern times, we elected one of the least experienced men, either in war policy or economic policy or what have you, and a guy who does not necessarily like politics uh, and didn't like politics when he was either a state senator in, in uh, Illinois or in his couple of years in the U.S. Senate here. I mean, he didn't make, he wasn't one of these guys that made pals and that schmoozed with his friends and what have you. He was sort of like, I got elected, I'm the 99th ranking guy, and I'm going to go run for president. Uh, and he did it. He did it. Okay. The Times on uh, Friday, October 10th, the headline is, Cry of GOP in Campaign, All is Dismal. And in a sense, it, the, the Times is arguing that with ISIS and, and Ebola, that in a sense, we're in a, we're in a mess. And in a sense, Obama's getting blamed for everything. Well, it's, unfortunately, presidents get too much credit for things that happen that are beneficial, economy, whatever, and too much blame for things that aren't. Uh, uh, so I, going back to the symbolism of, of you know, the certain things that presidents do that, that make you look like you, you, wanna, you, you want a leader. Uh, the country desperately wants a leader. Mm -hmm. And now whether you have the powers to be a leader or whether it's, it's rhetoric or what have you, I think, I think in this particular case, uh, we're looking for heroes. And, and I, uh, traditionally, this used to be sports heroes, used to be movie star heroes, used to be political heroes. And I think to a certain extent, the political process has been diminished and there's nobody on either side that people say, that's the guy I want in that job. Okay, let's, let, let, let's move to 2016. I mean, any heroes there? Well, there's a bunch of people that have been very effective governors uh, or in, their, in, their, in a smaller arena have, have done well, and they will emerge. The, the, the instant, instantaneously uh, recognition of a person who ends up being the nominee of a party or the VP candidate uh, overnight all of a sudden goes from zero uh, to 100% name ID. Uh, uh, so someone can emerge. The process itself, though, is such that uh, uh, that if you were a hero to start off with, uh, I, I think Dwight David Eisenhower, if you spent two billion dollars and ninety five percent of the commercials were negatives, uh, Dwight David Eisenhower would have lost World War II. Uh, basically, uh, uh, every man that was killed was his responsibility, I and mean, that's the way that's the way this negativism is. And I and I think I think I'm I'm, I'm saddened as a guy that spent my life around politics by what's happened to the political process. Unlimited money. There was more money being spent on politics than ever before. It's all negative. 95% uh, of the commercials are negative. There's a, a wall to wall airwaves. Uh, nobody, nobody talking about issues. Everybody talking about negativism. And what's happened is you have raised, you, you, you're driving voters away. The more money we have spent in politics in recent history, the less people turn out to vote. It's really pretty astounding. Now, Going to 16, let's look at the Democratic side. I mean, Hillary doesn't go, it's wide open. It's wide open. If it's, if it's Joe Biden, we, we win. Uh, who, who do you lose with, with the Democrats? Well, I think, I think they have to have someone emerge. Uh, I mean, Is there anybody there who conceivably if they, if they start, if, there's, if it's not Hillary, then they start in the same position. 
we that you guys we start in. Uh, and we, we may be stronger. Um, and it comes down those same eight or nine swing states again. Uh, but this is another battleground election. This is what, the, essentially the, well, the, the, the fourth one. The reality, the the one. reality is uh, the longest period uh, in, in modern times, there, there, are, there are, as I said to you earlier, there, there are 18 states in the District of Columbia that have voted six straight times Democrat. That's just not it. And how many electoral votes? That's 242 electoral votes. So it doesn't leave you very many that you have to get. And there's, there's several that have voted five and there's several that have voted four. But, there, but those 18, six straight times, uh, it basically gives you a real block. Those are the real blue states. Uh, Republican number is much smaller than that. So any Democrat begins with an advantage. And so in order to win, we have to take at least five and probably six of those eight or nine swing states, as Bush did, uh, to win very narrow margins. So. Uh, you know, the, the reality is when people say to me, Christie could be a viable candidate, I say, good, tell me one state that he can win against Hillary, that he, can he win New Jersey? Uh, can he win? No, you know, can he, he can't. Can he win Pennsylvania? I mean, just tell me, tell me a state that he's clear. Who? Who? Prognosticate. Uh, you know, I think, I think uh, uh, the, the issue here, as important as that question is, who can raise $150 million from January to January, which is probably what it's going to cost to win the nomination, okay? Uh, Back I, to money. Back to money. Then the moment you're the nominee, uh, you got to go raise two billion dollars. This next race will be a two billion dollar campaign. Public financing is now gone. Forget it. And as I said to you in, in the green room, I ran Reagan's campaign 30 years ago. When he became the nominee, and when Walter Mondale became the nominee, we both got a check for 40 million four hundred thousand dollars. That's all we could spend. No independent expenditures. Nothing. Joy dropping. Uh, we, ran, we ran a presidential campaign. We were advertising in all 50 states. Uh, we moved them around the country. Uh, we basically had 600,000 volunteers. Uh, it was more of a grassroots type of a campaign. Today, it's all about consultants. And, and there are 50 consultants in the Romney campaign who made in excess of a million dollars. Several who made in excess of $10 million. Uh, and so it's a consultant business. And I, I don't want to dump on, on a profession that I was around and was viewed as one. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's not about people. It's not about organizations. It's about how can you raise multiple billions, not millions, multiple billions. And the other add, add to this thing is that uh, if I'm running a campaign in Iowa, as a friend of mine is running Joni Ernst's campaign, there are five or six independent expenditures in there basically running their campaign. They're running, they're, they're trying to help her, but they they can't coordinate with the campaign. And so they're sending they, messages that, that, that she, she may not want or may anybody not, may, not, may not, want. not want. Or they're buying time when I want. I used to always buy a campaign. I, I never I bought the last three weeks of campaign. I bought from election day back. Sure. Uh, election day today is, is, a, is a moving target. It's, right. It's not election day per se. So my, my sense today is the game has changed dramatically. Uh, uh, we've not all quite figured it out yet. Um, I, I'm not sure. As I go back to the premise. The more money you spend, the less... Uh, the less, uh, uh, in, the more negative impact it has on voters. Okay, we'll have to stop here, Ed. Uh, uh, sort of a depressing note that we ended on, but it's, that well, it's now the next generation. Next generation can take it and run with it, and we've left them significant problems. It will be fixed. Uh, again, we're all Americans, and somehow, somewhere, we will come together. Next time, we'll talk about. Uh, your former employer and uh, Mike Huckabee and see if, if he really does run as an independent and really screw up the electoral process. But that's for the next Great. time. My thanks to political strategist Ed Rollins for his analysis of the November 2014 and 2016 elections. Remember, you got to vote. Next week, we talk with Richard Aborn, president of the Citizens Crime Commission, about New York City crime and NYPD policing here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.